Okay, so now we'll move on to basic investment types. There are many types of investments to choose from, but for this presentation, we'll only cover a few of the more common options. In order to begin to understand which investment types are best for you and your goals, it's important to understand their characteristics and why they may be suitable or not suitable for a particular investment objective that you may have. So the most common type of investment many here are stocks. So what are stocks? When you purchase stocks, which are also called equities, you become part owner of a company. This ownership gives you the right to vote at shareholder meetings and sometimes allows you to receive a share of the profits of the company through dividends. Now, not all companies offer dividends and they are not guaranteed, but when offered, they can be a good source of income. So if some people are looking to have income as one of the main strategies of investing, which I highly recommend should always be a part of it, is dividend income is a great source of it. But you'll have to find the companies that give you good dividends and also the companies are strong that will continue to generate the profits so that you can get that uh, dividend. Now, high quality stocks are simple to buy and sell on the open market. This means you can easily sell your stocks when you want. Stocks can be an excellent way to increase wealth and fight inflation due to their ability to increase in value over the long term. So this is what I mean by this. When we see inflation, inflation is what is known as a silent killer. Back in the early 80s, right, I remember, mid 80s actually, I remember a soda can was a quarter. Now you can't get a soda can for a quarter, 50, or even 75 cents in many places. It's like a dollar for now, just like a can of soda, one dollar. What happened? Why did it go up in price? It went up in price in short because of inflation. So that means if you just take a hundred dollars and stuff it in your mattress, you know, 30, 40 years ago, would that $100 still be worth the same today? It wouldn't be. That's why investing in stocks can increase wealth because a stock price will grow over time. However, there are some downsides. These results are not guaranteed and past performance cannot ensure future returns. One of the major drawbacks of stocks is that they can lose their entire value should the underlying company go bankrupt or suffer unanticipated losses. And stocks can be highly volatile, meaning the value of your investment can go up and down significantly. So I really believe that stocks are one of those long-term investments that we need in order to fight inflation, especially if we're going to live a long time. Now, let's talk about, you know, people think, if I invest a stock, I could lose all of it. It depends on what type of stock. Small cap stocks, there is a good shot, right? Penny stocks that you could lose everything because they may not last. But let's look at like a Microsoft or Apple, Exxon, some of the largest companies in the world. What are the chances of, of those companies losing everything they got? Right now, very slim. At the most, it could potentially lose 10, 15 Maybe if we had another 2008 crisis, 20, 30%, but you're not going to lose all of it. So again, stocks are volatile. You can lose money, but dependent upon the stock you have, that is where the benefits and drawbacks differ. Another thing about stocks is that there is a, another subclass of stocks called preferred. So you have preferred stocks and then also you have common stocks and common stocks are the ones that majority of people buy. Preferred stocks are in between a bond, which I'll cover in the next section, and a stock. Where a preferred stock, you'll get a nice dividend rate and also you'll own a share of the stock where it could have the potential up and down or in that case the up if you want to see to try to benefit from the uptake of a stock price going up now one real quick thing about trading stocks when you're trading stocks you are not buying from the company that sold that stock initially right you are buying from people who own the stock on a secondary market like the new york stock exchange and nasdaq the only time that a company sells a stock and will get money off of it right is the ipo or if it does another release of common shares to people. But those are not traded on the secondary market in the sense where they sell it to you, they keep the money, 
that is the initial side of a company giving up stocks. But when you buy and sell, right, and you want it to be liquid, which means you can get money out immediately, that is done on the secondary market. Well, let's look at bonds, another very common investment. Essentially, a bond is a loan that you make to a government, corporation, or other entity. And so bonds are part of a category called fixed income investments. And this is because in exchange for loaning them your money, the bond issuer agrees to pay you interest on your money and eventually pay back the amount of money lent out to you. The interest rate is stated up front and is determined by the prevailing interest rates. If you're a company, it's the market interest rate. And also for the government, it's the federal, uh, the Fed rate that is set. And also the risk associated with purchasing the bond. Rating agencies like Moody's, S&P, use rating designations to indicate the credit quality of the bond and the issuer. And this is very, very important, right? Because you, I, I highly recommend that we look at investment-grade bonds. If you want to junk bonds, right, those have a high probability of not paying back, but you get a higher return. That should be on your speculative side. So generally, bonds in the A or high B categories are considered to have a low risk of default, while junk bonds in the C category are considered to have a significant risk of default. And default is a risk that the issuer won't pay back the initial investment that you gave in them or the initial loan. Bonds are popular among investors who are looking for income. They are uh, a great source of uh, you know conservative type of investments um, where you get the income and hopefully you beat out inflation. And one of the main attractions of investment grade bonds is their relative safety from the loss of principal. So for example, bonds issued by the US Treasury, they're considered to be, the, to be risk free since there is virtually no chance that the government will fail to pay back your initial investment because they can just print money, right? However, now safety and stability come at a cost because there is little risk involved, there is little potential return on highly rated bonds. So let's say the government bonds. Some of them are giving less than 1%. What if inflation is 2-3%? You're actually losing money over the long haul. So you have to weigh the, weigh the pros and the cons. Now, this also doesn't mean that the bonds don't have the risk, just like I mentioned. While they are less volatile than stocks, bond prices tend to fall when interest rates rise. So this means that investors who hold bonds and try to sell them when interest rates are rising may lose some of their investment since buyers will prefer bonds with higher interest rates. So this issue only affects bondholders though who plan to sell the bonds. Those who keep their bonds until maturity will get back the full bond amount. So let me dig a little bit deeper. Say that there's a company and it's giving you 6% in interest and you gave them a hundred dollars on year one let's say in year two the same a very similar company issues a bond but the market rate that they give is eight percent right and it's a very similar company size same um, rating and everything like that let's say that you want to sell your bond because you need the money for something you cannot sell your bond at par which is the hundred dollars that you gave because somebody would just say well i can get pay $100 to this company get 8% instead of the 5% that you're getting. So what people do is they have to sell the bond at a discount. So in order for you to liquidate it, you'll have to sell it at $96, $97. So if you sell it at $96, $97 and the person buying it gets it at a discount. So it'll make the $3, $4 profit and then also the 5% of the bond that you sold. So it gets 8%, maybe even 9 if you needed to sell it quickly. So that's how bonds work, right? They're inverse with rising interest rates. And another issue though, is that there is inflation problems. Um, bonds do not generally increase in value over time, meaning that inflation eats away at the principal each year, just like I mentioned an example before. So another type of investments are CDs. They are very commonly issued by the banks. And this is basically a promissory note, right? A promise from a bank and insured by the FDIC, the federal um, uh, uh, entity that will guarantee that if a bank goes belly up, you'll get up to $250,000 per account. And so what some people do is if they have half a million, 
they instead of putting all half a million in one bank, they'll put it in different accounts um, and different banks. So they'll get the two hundred fifty thousand just in case uh, something happens. So it, it pays you as a holder a stated interest rate and the cds can be issued in any denomination and generally have terms ranging from one month to five years and unlike a bond cds typically are not sold on the secondary market there are some that do have secondary i've used them i've sold them and bought some and it depends some are right for people some are not um, and it all depends on what again your investment objectives are Unlike a bond, like I said, um, you know they're not sold and generally are held into maturity. And if you sold a bond, there's no penalty, right? Because you may have to take a haircut, but there's no penalty like a CD. And it has some liquidity issues where you may have to pay a couple months worth of interest as a penalty if you liquidate early. And just like a bond, it does have some inflation risk, especially with CDs now. I mean, it's some are in the 0.5.6%. And again, if inflation is even 1%, you're losing that money. So it's important that you really seriously look at not putting too much money into uh, something that is not going to beat out inflation. So next we have mutual funds and mutual funds are the most popular investment option today well one of them at least and in short a mutual fund is a collection of stocks bonds or other investment types and when you buy shares of a mutual fund you are pooling your money with a number of other investors so this enables you as part of a group to pay a professional manager to select investments and manage the fund and also be diversified because let's look at one example let's just say you have ten thousand dollars and what you want to do is you want to buy 25 stocks to be diversified so 25 stocks over international some small cap some large cap um, you also want to be in some different industries, um, uh, you know, tech industry, finance industry. But the problem is $10,000, 25 stock. If a stock price is $1,000 alone, you, you probably won't be able to buy it. So how if you only can save maybe 100 200 a month, it'd be very, very difficult to buy stocks directly. So this is why mutual funds are set up where... 10 people with $10,000 puts their money together and can buy those 25 stocks, no problem. Now, mutual funds are set up with a specific investment strategy in mind, and it's spelled out in the prospectus. Um, they can focus on nearly any kind of investment, large stocks, small stocks, government bonds, corporate bonds, a mix of stocks from certain countries. There's a lot of different types of mutual funds. And as I mentioned before, one of the major advantages of a mutual fund is that you could take advantage of the professional management, especially those at, that are pros at this. And I uh, mentioned in uh, a previous the previous introduction video that those on Wall Street have the DAC uh, stacked in their favor and against us just because of the technology that they have, the connections that they have. So we're taking advantage of their resources. Now, since you are paying professional management, especially for actively managed funds, right? And there's a difference between passively managed. Typically, managers are paid according to the performance of fund at times. So they have a vested interest in delivering results, but it comes at a price, especially if the expense ratio is high. There are some people out there that believe instead of paying professionals to actively manage it uh, because studies have shown that many don't beat the market just by a passively managed mutual fund and that is a mutual fund that mirrors the index what is an index an index is you know the dow jones the s p 500 it's a collection of all those stocks that are averaged out on their prices so what happens is is that when we say okay the dow jones is up 10 points is a 30 companies that are in the dow we average out how well that they did if an actively manage a manager beats the a market that's very good but some will lose out in attempts to beat it right because they'll bad market timing bad investments there's also taxes and fees that are associated with it and so it does come at a price um, another advantage um, that I mentioned is that mutual funds offer a very simple way to diversify your portfolio since even a small amount of money can be shared across many different investments. One of the downsides on the mutual funds though are the tax consequences can be hard to control and this is what it means. If you have a brokerage account that's not in a 
taxable or a, a qualified account, right? Like a Roth IRA, traditional, your 401k. And you're in a mutual fund. If the fund manager sells a stock and it made a profit, the profits are pushed down to you as a mutual fund holder and you have to pay taxes on those. So you don't have control on whether or not you have to pay taxes on that or not. It's all up to the person selling, the manager selling the stock. Okay, so let's look at annuities. So annuities are really an insurance product. It's a popular tax-deferred investment option for investors at or near retirement. Now, here's my uh, uh, thoughts on annuities. Annuities have a place. Um, I don't believe that they're right for everybody, just like some people make them out to be, just like a stock. Again, everybody's different. So there are some benefits to annuities, but there are also some downsides that I believe that people underrepresent, which is why people buy them more than they should in some cases. So an annuity is a contract between you and an insurance company that gives you the right to annual income for a specified period of time. And during the initial stage, you make contributions to the annuity, which are allowed to grow on a tax deferred basis. And the word annuity literally means annual payments. The annuities we will be discussing are typically investments meant for the long term for retirement. As such, there may be surrender charges, and this is one of the downsides of annuities. If the money is withdrawn early, it could be subject to a 10% tax penalty if it's taken out before 59 and a half and also some very large surrender charges. A lot of annuities have a 10% or 7% surrender charge, meaning you put money into annuity a year later, you want to take it out, fine, here's the money. You may be hit with a 10% penalty. Also, you'll be hit with a 10% or 7% uh, um, um, surrender charge. So if you put in $100, you'll get $90 back. You may not have made anything, right? And the surrender charges usually work that for every year you hold on to it, it goes down a percentage. So if you hold it for three years, instead of 10%, it'll be 7%. And six, five, every year it goes out. So usually that when people can surrender annuity is seven, 10 years out to avoid the surrender charge. Um, annuities also have a lot of fees and expenses associated with them. They also may have separate account management fees and other insurance costs, such as mortality and expense fees. This is why annuities have, out of all the investment products, one of the highest expenses. And in the long run, expenses will eat away at your return. So that's why you have to be very careful at what you choose as your investments. So. There are two main types of annuities, deferred and immediate. On the left-hand side, you see that, immediate and deferred. So with an immediate annuity, you pay the insurance company a lump sum and you begin income payments right away. You could choose whether you want income guaranteed for a specific number of years or over your lifetime. And the insurance calculates your income payments based on the original investment that you put in and also your life expectancy or payment term. And as you can see, any guarantees offered by an annuity are subject to the claims paying ability of the issuing insurance company. So you want to make sure that the annuity uh, that you bought um, is issued by a very strong company because if the insurance company goes belly up, unfortunately, you're going to be out of luck. So that's why you want to make sure that the company is strong. And a deferred annuity has two phases. So it's an accumulation phase during which you contribute and let your money grow. And then the payout phase, which you begin to receive scheduled payments during this time. So during accumulation, the earnings grow tax deferred until you withdraw it. And during the payment phase, payout phase, which typically starts during retirement, you can choose how much to withdraw each year, usually up to a maximum of 5 or 6%. It depends on the annuity. This means that you can control when you take income payments and when to pay the taxes on them. Investors also have the option of choosing between fixed and variable annuities, which differ in the way they generate earnings and the amount of risk involved. So a fixed annuity offers you a guaranteed interest rate for a certain period of time. And at the end of the period, the insurance company will declare a new rate and then a new guarantee period. Most fixed annuities will have a minimum interest rate that is guaranteed for the life of the contract, meaning that you'll never receive less than that guaranteed minimum. Fixed annuities typically appeal to investors who feel more comfortable knowing exactly how much they will receive each year. And as you can see, 
Um, any guarantees offered by an annuity are subject to the strength of the issuing insurance company and the claims paying ability. Uh, again, you'll get that guarantee, but then the, the question will be, well, that amount, if I invested it elsewhere, could I get a higher amount with not much more risk? So that's part of the pros and cons of this. Variable annuities invest the principal among a variety of investment options. So your returns are tied to the performance of the sub accounts. That's what they're called. And so the main benefit of variable annuities is that you have the opportunity to earn, to earn higher returns in exchange for a certain amount of risk. Now, some variable annuities offer you the option of guaranteeing a minimum amount of income during periods of poor investment results. So that's a benefit. Um, variable annuities typically will appeal to investors who are willing to have the higher rate of risk in return for a higher growth potential. And the principal and investment earnings in a variable annuity are not guaranteed and will fluctuate with the investment performance. So this means that your annuity value may be worth less than your original investment. So again, you want to make sure you do your research. Okay, so ETFs. ETFs are also known as exchange traded funds. They look like a mutual fund, right? But they trade on a stock exchange like a stock. So they're kind of a hybrid. So ETFs are designed to replicate the performance of an underlying index like the S&P 500. And we talked about it, the S&P 500 or 500 companies that are on the S&P and they average out their uh, gains and uh, losses, right? So while a mutual fund can hold any security that is in line with its investment strategy, ETFs only hold the invested investments listed in the underlying index that they're attached to. Lately, there have been some more actively managed ETFs, so that's a little bit different. But again, like ETFs, their uh, regular ETFs are traded on the stock. And, and what is the difference is mutual funds are, you know, their net asset value. The price of a mutual fund is, you know, given once a day. You buy and you sell, it's that one time a day. When it comes to stock, you can buy and sell any time during the time that the stock market is open. So the price can go up and down every single day um, or multiple times a day, unlike a mutual fund, which is you know just a one time a day thing. Also, you could short an ETF. Short means you are betting it's gonna lose money. So that's what pe some people can, they say you can make money in an up or down market because you go long when the market's going up and you go short when the market's going down. And we'll talk about those a little bit later on. So. Um, for this reason about you know the ETFs being um, listed in the underlying index, um, un uh, you know unlike mutual funds, ETFs are considered to be passively managed. Uh, however, they are becoming more actively managed, like I talked about. Benefits are ETFs that they typically have very low management fees relative to mutual funds, and they can easily be traded on exchanges. But you may incur the trading expenses if actively buying and selling. Okay, so let's talk about alternative investments. Uh, this is the last portion of this video. And we've learned about you know, the basic investment types that most investors hold in their portfolios. Stocks, bonds, you know, the CDs, and some of these insurance products. Now, the category of alternative investments have grown considerably after the 2008 crisis. And it really is very broad. It's any name given, it's, it's any investment given um, that falls outside of the basic investments of the stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and annuities. So things like the precious metals, REITs, which are the real estate investment trust, private equity, hedge funds, senior secured loans, and some others. There's thousands of them out there. And I'm only going to briefly talk about a few of them. And I'm a big fan of alternative investments. But again, you know, you got to make sure that it is right for you because it can be a lot more volatile. So alternative investments, um, they contain hundreds, thousands of very complex securities. Uh, we will cover some of the main ones and they can be an excellent addition to a well diversified portfolio to hedge or protect your portfolio against specific risks or add some opportunities for growth that you may not otherwise have. However, these types of investments are often very high risk and require specialized knowledge to use effectively. That's why try not to do this on your own unless you feel comfortable with your own expertise. It is usually uh, advised that you do consult a, uh, a professional about this. So I always advocate that investors focus on building a solid financial foundation and working with a good financial professional unless you can do it yourself. Um, 
get all that set up, get a good plan, and then use alternatives to bolster your plan. Having them as the main kind of core of a plan is very risky if, if again, um, you're not very diversified. So precious metals, right, particularly gold, are often used to hedge against economic downturns since gold prices often move counter to economic trends. But right gold is very volatile and in my opinion is a speculative investment and i'll talk about this later but uh, warren buffett he not a big fan of gold and i'll explain why and and there is a place for gold but you know lately with the 2000 crisis you a lot of commercials and all that kind of stuff uh people are trying to sell you stuff right and one of the things that you want to look at when buying an investment and you're buying it from somebody how do they get paid are they making a commission off that investment if they are is it in your best interest or are they doing it just to make money, right? So that's why you want to be careful. Okay, so let's look at REITs or real estate investment trusts. And they're commonly used to give investors the benefit in investing in real estate without having to own the property outright. You don't have to worry about is it going to be rented out? Is it people are going to take care of it? Um, do I have to, you know, worry about, you know, plumbing going bad or electrical work or something like that? You don't have to worry about that. So REITs often invest in commercial properties such as shopping centers. There are REITs out there that do apartment buildings. There are one that do hospitals, senior care centers. There's a REIT that I've used uh, that do industrial warehouses and even some uh, self-storage units. Um, REITs expose, however, an investor to special risks with investing in real estate. So there is, you know, 2000 crisis, if you invest in a REIT and you try to sell, it was very difficult for a lot of people to get out. So there is that uh, liquidity risk that you run into with REITs. Um, also, the units or shares that you purchase can fluctuate in value and redemption that's based upon the price of the real estate. So if you're in a down market, it could go down um, and it could be less or even more than what was originally invested. And then Prior to investing, a lot of these alternative investments, particularly REITs, um, you have to, you know, uh, meet specific suitability standards. Be what they call an accredited investor, and some states have different ones, but it depends on how much you make and how much your net worth is. Private equity, that's an investment directly buying private companies instead of like buying a stock on an exchange. Private equity investments can be difficult to sell though because you have to find a buyer that's willing to, you know, it's not like buying or selling a stock like Microsoft. It's actually, you want to buy this company. Oh, by the way, you have to manage everything about that company, right? So that's why the majority of private equity investors are large institutions or wealthy individuals who can afford to speculate and you need a lot of money to do private equity. Hedge funds are similar in structure to mutual funds, um, but they're they're not you know as heavily regulated as mutual funds, so that's why they can be risky, more risky at times. And the name hedge funds means that it's to hedge against specific market movements to seek out increased returns in an up or down market. So in a regular mutual fund, if the market goes down, you lose money. If the market goes up, you make money. The goal of a hedge fund is that you make a money regardless of going up or down. Hedge funds have very high cost. A lot of them follow a 220 model, 2% 2 interest or expense ratio per year, and then 20% of the profit. So that means you have to make sure that you're willing to do that. CD Secure Loans are one of my favorite where, um, like let's say when General Motors went bankrupt, if you were a stockholder, you lost everything. If you were a bondholder, you got 20 cents on the dollar. But if you were a senior secured loan holder, which, which means you were on top of the pyramid, uh, you were secured, top senior right and there's a loan that you gave out you got every dollar back out that's what happened with the senior secure guys with um gm so that's a, a benefit that you have again one of the n downsides is that uh, there is liquidity once you're in it you're in it because you're giving a money a loan and you can't just demand this company to pay all of it back immediately so that's why there's pros and cons to everything the biggest thing is you know remember that alternative investments are not suitable for all investors and all alternative investments such as hedge funds, private equity investments are subject to significant risks. And so with all investing, there is the potential to lose a lot or sometimes your entire amount invested. You want to make sure that it's right for you. And so the next video, we'll go ahead and talk about some of the strategies behind it.